You've got to escape from here and tell the world what you've seen. That will be your duty. Samuel Wielenberg, Surviving Treblinka The exhibition, The Image of Treblinka in the Eyes of Samuel Wielenberg, organized by the Institute of National Remembrance at the Janusz Kurteka History Point Educational Center in Warsaw, presents 15 bronze sculptures made in the years 1999 to 2003, depicting figures of prisoners and scenes from everyday life at the camp, which portray the artist's painful memories of that time. Quotes from Samuel Wielenberg's book, Surviving Treblinka in English and Polish, were used as descriptions of the exhibits. This has allowed the author's voice to reverberate fully. The exhibition, together with the educational project on Wielenberg's work, was realized thanks to the kindness and great trust placed in the Institute of National Remembrance by the widow of the artist, Mrs. Ada Christina Wielenberg, who has been tirelessly continuing her husband's work aimed at preserving the memory of the Holocaust, especially among young generations. Descending from the Boxcar Bronze 2000 One sun-drenched morning that day, as every day, the shouts of the foremen were reverberating across the yard as they spurred us on to work. From the railway platform, we heard the clatter of flanged wheels inching toward the camp. The first morning transport had arrived, loaded with the condemned, who as yet had no idea of what awaited them here. The Blues Bronze 2001. This detail usually consisted of Hasidic Jews. One could see by their demeanor that most of them had been yeshiva students and had dressed until very recently in traditional attire. This modest group, with the broom as its emblem, was in charge of cleaning the freight cars and scattering disinfectant. It was they who removed the bodies of the people who died in the freight cars during the transport and hauled them to the lazarette to be incinerated. Lazarette, German, military hospital. In Treblinka, the deceptive term for the area with a killing pit in which a fire was kept burning. Ordered to remove their shoes, bronze, 2002. Again, the train stopped. Now it lurched backward. The cars rocked violently. Through the grating, I saw that most of the train had been left behind at the station. Our wagon and a few others were being pushed slowly onto a siding. Then some huts burst into view, beside the track in the forest. Immediately behind them stood a huge pile of shoes. People milled about this way and that in the pile and around it. I found myself in a yard about 30 meters wide with huts on either side. I took a position within a herd of men alongside the hut. A group of some 15 Jews, all with red armbands, ordered us to sit on the ground, take off our shoes, and tie them together by the laces. Homage to Ruth Dorfman, Bronze, 2001 We entered the hut and proceeded to a little hut where a row of prisoners in white hairdresser's smocks stood, each beside a small stool. I donned a smock which was hanging on the wall, pulled a pair of scissors from a crack between two boards, and stood like the other hairdressers beside one of the available stools. Hundreds of women passed my way that day. Among them was a very lovely one, about twenty years old. Her name was Ruth Dorfman, she said, and she has already graduated from high school. She was well aware of what awaited her and kept it no secret from me. Her beautiful eyes displayed neither fear nor agony of any kind, only pain and boundless sadness. How long will I have to suffer? She asked. Only a few moments, I answered. 
A heavy stone seemed to roll off her heart. Tears welled up in our eyes. Zuhu Mil of the SS passed by. We fell silent until he was gone. I continued cutting her long, silken hair. When I had finished, Ruth stood up from the stool and gave me one long, last look, as if saying goodbye to me and to a cruel, merciless world, and set out slowly in her final walk. Undressed women on their way to the gas chamber. Bronze, 2000. People were ushered from the platform towards the wide open gate that led to the transport yard. After crossing it, the SS ordered the men to undress, while the women were directed to the hut. Naked women with children were rushed to the row of hairdressers, and then they were led further to the path of death to the gas chambers. A crippled Jew at the entrance to the Lazarette, Bronze, 2002. Huge piles of clothing were ranged parallel to the hut. At the edge of the yard, 150 meters away, stood the fence with its intertwined pine branches. An opening in this fence was marked by a red cross flag. I reached a little room, camouflaged at every angle, with benches along the walls. Elderly and crippled men sat on the benches, and a capo wearing a white apron and a red cross armband stood in the middle of the room. He turned to the older people and with a great deference asked them to undress for a medical examination. They sat down, withered and shivering with cold. Noticing my presence, the orderly ordered me to leave at once through a door to the right. As I obeyed, however, I found a wall of shrubbery in my way. To circumvent it, I turned left and climbed to the top of a raised bank of sand. Ahead of me, a bored Ukrainian sentry sat on a little chair, clutching a rifle. Before him, down below, was a deep pit. At its bottom were heaps of corpses, which had not yet been consumed by a fire burning under them. Lazarette, German, military hospital, in Treblinka, a killing pit disguised as an infirmary where the sick and disabled were executed. An inmate collecting bottles, bronze, 2000. The prams were used for collecting bottles, thermos flasks, jars, and aluminium containers. The prisoners who handled these items had the right to cross the transport yard to a storeroom reserved for them. It was situated behind the hut where the women undressed. There, behind the hut, bottles of all shapes and sizes were piled. The prisoners in charge of the bottles were nicknamed the Flaschen Sortierung Commando, the bottle sorting detail. The new detail was ordered to collect all bottles, including broken and small ones which had once held medicines. They were being collected not for any value they might possess, but as part of the cover-up of what was happening in Treblinka. When the war was over, by which time we would no longer be here, the presence of so many medicine bottles in this little area could only be incriminating. This was the only reason to gather them up and ship them in a direction unknown to us. A Girl from Warsaw, Bronze, 2002 One little girl was left alone on the platform. Her age was difficult to ascertain. The torn rags which covered her delicate, slender body had apparently been a dress at one time. On her head was a colorful kerchief. She gnawed at its fringes with her white teeth. Her large, Doe-like black eyes flashed about in fright. Her skinny legs were red from the frost, and her feet were sheathed in gleaming shoes with very high heels, in stark contrast with the rest of her 
miserable attire. She was clutching a partly eaten loaf of bread to her chest, as if afraid that someone might steal it from her. Like an apparition from another world, she approached the sorters one after another, glancing at the contents of the suitcases as if she were browsing around a market. The SS man meter approached her and pushed her toward the opening in the green fence with its flapping red cross flag. No one said a word. Everyone watched the little girl from Warsaw being pushed toward the lazaret. German military hospital. In the camp, it was a killing pit, disguised as an infirmary where the sick and disabled were executed. She vanished behind the fence. A few minutes later, we heard a shot. Silence. Utter silence everywhere. A concert. Bronze. 2002. Among the 50 new men was the famous Warsaw musician Artur Gold. He and the other two prisoners added up to a violin trio. The trio of musicians began to play popular pre-war tunes which, reminding of years gone by, left us depressed and sore of heart. The Germans were pleased with themselves. They had succeeded in organizing an orchestra in the death camp. After one of these concerts, the Germans reached a conclusion. The maestros did not look good. They ordered our tailors to sew jackets of shiny, loud blue cloth and to attach giant bow ties to the collars. Dressed as clowns, they entertained us after roll call, day in, day out. However spent we might be after a 12-hour working day, we had to stand in rank and take in a concert. An inmate in Cantor's garb, bronze, 1999 to 2000. When the Germans noticed that the prisoners were going to the latrine too often and spending too much time there, the SS Lalka, Yiddish doll, the camp's deputy commandant, Kurt Franz, ordered the foreman to go to the storeroom and procure two rabbinical black suits and a couple of black hats with pompons on them. Two prisoners were equipped with whips. It was their job to make sure no more than five prisoners entered the outhouse at any one time and that they spent no more than one minute inside. Alarm clocks dangled from their necks on strings. They were called the Scheiss Commando. As for their job, they took a contrary attitude to it. Thanks to them, the latrines became points of rendezvous between ourselves and prisoners from different groups. Here, we exchanged news and information with the Scheiss Commando hovering protectively outside. Whenever a real guard approached, the Scheiss Commando began to make a racket which indicated that it was time to hurry out. An Inmate Sorting Belongings Bronze 2001 we marched to a large yard behind our hut, which was cluttered from one end to the other with mountains of shoes and scattered heaps of clothing and luggage. These rose to a height of some ten meters around them, and there were thousands of open suitcases, their locks broken, and their owners' names smeared on them in oil paint. Prisoners would take up positions amid the open suitcases beside the hut and sought all the belongings of the Jews who had been transported from all over occupied Europe to this dead earth. The suitcases were filled with spoons, knives, eyeglasses, pocket knives, shaving brushes, fountain pens, all the little items packed by the people who had been brought here. An artist, painter inmate preparing misleading signs. Bronze, 2001. Another prisoner approached us, a professional painter from Warsaw, a man of medium height with a hawk's nose and a very black moustache on his fair-skinned face. He was wearing a wide-brimmed black hat and a narrow black bow tie around his neck. He often talked to me at great length about his work. I do paintings, portraits for the Germans, 
They bring me photos of their relatives, wives, mothers, and children. The SS describe their families to me with emotion and love, the color of their eyes, their hair. I produce family portraits from amateurish blurred black and white photos. The artist was especially distraught on this occasion. He had been ordered to paint an array of little white signs. First class, second class, third class, waiting room, cashier, and a model of a large round wall clock. Several days later, the Germans ordered us to hang the clock on the wall of the hut alongside the platform. Now the platform looked like an ordinary railway station. The Head of the Artist Samuel Wielenberg, Bronze 2002 Samuel Wielenberg was among 200 inmates who on the 2nd of August 1943 succeeded in escaping from the Treblinka German extermination camp. At the moment of his death in 2016, he remained the last survivor of the rebellion in Treblinka. Samuel Wielenberg was born in 1923 in Częstochowa, Poland, the son of Maniefa, nay Popov, and Peretz Wielenberg. He had two sisters, his elder, Ita, and younger, Tamara. In October 1942, he arrived at the Treblinka camp in a transport of 6,000 Jews deported from the Opatów ghetto. Most perished immediately. He was the only one who remained alive. On his first night in the camp, Wielenberg heard a familiar voice, as if from a great distance. It was Professor Mering, his elementary school history teacher. That night, Mering urged him, You've got to escape from here and tell the world what you've seen. That will be your duty. Wielenberg was in Treblinka until the outbreak of the rebellion on the 2nd of August 1943. He saw with his own eyes the arrival of hundreds of thousands of Jews and thousands of Roma and witnessed them being sent to death in the gas chambers. His own sisters, Ita and Tamara, were killed there. Wienenberg himself suffered humiliation, violence, cruelty, and extreme viciousness at the hands of the German SS staff and the Ukrainian SS Wachmänner guards. Inmates in the camp organized the rebellion with the objective of avenging the murders and destroying the extermination facilities. Wienenberg took part in the uprising and was shot in the leg. Wounded and under gunfire, he managed to escape and reached Warsaw. Under the assumed name of Ignatza Popov, Eagle, he took part in the Warsaw Uprising of August 1944, first within the ranks of the Home Army and then the Polish People's Army. After the war, he remained in Poland. In 1950, following his father's death, he emigrated to Israel with his mother and his wife, Ada. Professor Mering was killed in Treblinka, and Samuel Fielenberg carried out his teacher's behest until his death. Wielenberg wrote his memoir of the camp and uprising and commemorated them in his book, Surviving Treblinka, 1984. He made pencil drawings and cast bronze sculptures based on his memories of the murder site. He and his wife accompanied youth delegations and tours to Poland to give testimony about what he had experienced in Treblinka. For his activities during and after the Second World War, Samuel Wielenberg received the highest national honors of the Republic of Poland, including the Virtuti Militari, the Cross of Merit with Swords, the Cross of Valor, the Warsaw Uprising Cross, the Order of Merit of the Republic of Poland, the Order of Polonia Restituta, and the Polish Army Medal. This exhibition presents sculptures, drawings, and excerpts of his testimony, describing figures and scenes that Wielenberg remembered and wanted to commemorate. In spite of the perpetrator's efforts to destroy all traces, the sculptures provide direct evidence of their deeds. The 2nd of August, 1943. The Insurrection, Bronze, 2002-2003. to 2003. 
The date chosen was the 2nd of August 1943, a day I shall never forget. As that long-anticipated day dawned, our hearts pounded with the hope that now, maybe, a dream would at last come true. We had little thought for ourselves and our lives. Our overwhelming desire was to obliterate the death factory which had been our home. Utter silence reigned in the camp. The familiar sentries were positioned on the watchtowers, as usual, fixing languid eyes on us. SS men hurried about the area just as they did every day. Nothing at all hinted at what was about to unfold here. The silence was meant to fool our enemy. The Germans, ordinarily so suspicious, were off their guard. They did not imagine that a prisoner's insurrection was about to break out that day. The rebellion was timed to start at 4.30 p.m. Shortly before 4, and not as planned, we heard an explosion from the direction of the Germans' huts. The Ukrainian at the gate to the vegetable patch let loose a burst of gunfire. One of our men returned fire. The Ukrainian fell lifeless at the fence. I seized the rifle and ran to the Germans' compound. I could see rifles protruding from the windows of the Ukrainians' huts, firing into the forest. As the hail of gunfire intensified, other prisoners followed us towards the gate. We heard thunderous explosions from the garage. Flames soared over the trees. A pillar of fire burst from the garage. The Germans' huts burned. The dry pine branches we had woven into the fence burned as well. Srebrenica had become one massive blaze. The 2nd of August, 1943. Escape during the insurrection. Bronze, 2002. I ran with the others toward the vegetable garden. Reaching the fence, I was greeted by a horrifying sight. Masses of human corpses strewn between the tank obstacles. Dead prisoners stood erect like tombstones. Dozens of human bodies leaned against the obstacles and the barbed wire fences. Machine gun fire continued to rain down relentlessly from the watchtowers. As I skipped across the bodies of my dead comrades, I felt a sudden pain in my leg and a sharp blow. My shoe filled with blood. I had been hit in the leg. Limping, I reached the railway track. I was alone, desperately thirsty, dressed only in a shirt and trousers. One of my shoes was filled with blood. My leg throbbed horribly. I removed the cap from my shaven head. I had no clear plan of action. I depended only on my instincts. 